Hello, welcome to Mastering Java Volume 2. Uh, here we're going to switch gears a little bit in the course. Up until now we have been rounding out our skills in terms of uh, loops and uh, different types of loops and control structures in Java and those very important stuff uh, we've done a lot of examples to get you comfortable with how to use the while loops and the do while loops and the for loops and the if statements and all of that stuff but now I really want to change the direction of the latter half of this course a little bit and uh, what we're going to do here is start to talk about a little bit about the class structure of Java and then in the last part of the course we're going to learn how to use a lot of the built-in math functions in Java a lot of times you're trying to calculate something uh, and there's always a, a lot of times a very easy way to do it using the built-in math functions of Java so before we get there I want to show you how to how to look up more detailed Java information about classes now I know we haven't talked much about classes yet in detail but I'm kind of inching my way into it I think I've covered up until now uh, drilled it in that, that Java is just chock full of a class structure and I'm going to reveal a little bit of the richness of that class structure right now and then in later sections when we talk about classes in detail you'll understand even more how it's structured. So right now here's a web browser. Um, if you go to this web address docs.oracle.com java se slash 7 slash doc slash api um, the 7 here means this is Java version 7 that's what's current as of the time of this a particular course API stands for application programming interface and so basically it's a bunch of documentation about how Java is structured so when you go and hit enter there you're taking you're taken to a page that looks something like this so it says Java platform standard edition number seven now if you're watching this course two or three years from now we might be on Java 8 or Java 9 but the core uh, fundamentals of the the structure of Java is really not going to going to change I mean it has to kind of remain consistent from version to version they may add functionality but certainly everything we talk about in this section is going to remain the same. So the reason we don't show you this stuff in the beginning of a course is because it's extremely detailed. Look at all the stuff here. You can go, your eyes can cross uh, when you're when you're starting to look at this and and when you don't know anything at all about Java it's completely overwhelming to start looking at stuff like this. But now we know a little bit. We've done a little bit of programming and so now I think it's um, instructive to go and talk about that. So in the left hand pane we have what we call packages. These are the Java packages and if you remember we were importing some packages with the import keyword um, uh, in a few examples and I'll get to that in just a minute but anyway here's a list of packages and here's a listing of all the classes in Java and you can see lots and lots and lots of different classes lots and lots and lots of different packages. We're not going to cover all this stuff. What I want to show you is a couple of very specific things. If you scroll down here, you'll find a Java package called java.lang. That means java.language. That is the fundamental Java package that's always available to you to use in your programs, even without importing anything. In other words, the java.language package consists of a bunch of classes and supporting, um, supporting features that are always available anytime you write Java. You don't have to specifically import anything there so let's click on java.lang and see if we recognize anything so once we click it the only thing that changes is down here now it says java.lang we have something called interfaces we have something called classes now again um, I know that we haven't discussed a lot of details about what a class is we're going to get into that a lot more later but you can think of a class as a template it's it's when you basically are defining a template for how something's going to work so you can see in Java we have templates that uh, define what booleans look like. We've talked about boolean data types, uh, we've talked about characters, uh, and so on. There's floats down here, there's integers down here, and so on. So these are the classes that are wrapped up into this java.lang package, and all of these classes are always accessible to anybody writing a Java program. You don't have to import anything extra. If you're going to use any other methods or classes in any of these other packages here, then you need to import it using the import keyword um, and if you remember back when we were using the scanner class, we had to actually put an import keyword before we could use it. So that's why we had to do that. We'll get to that a little bit more. So let's go ahead and click on java.lang again. Um, there's, you, can, you can thumb through here and kind of read a lot of stuff, but what I want to show you is the system class. There is a system class inside of the java.lang um, package and you can see we're looking under classes so if we go to system remember when we try to print something to the screen we do system.out.println 
So what we're going to click on is system here, and this is a class called system. And then there are methods. See, there are methods here that are a member of this class. So everything's like a tree. At the top, you have the packages, which are collections of things. And then you have the classes, which are sort of templates for how things are going to work. And then under that, you have methods, which are these subroutines, if you've used any other language you can you can see that there's lots of different subroutines that work yet you, you have something that runs something called a garbage collector you have something that returns an unmodifiable string map view of the current system environment and all these things are they're not going to make sense until you really have a need to drill down and to figure out and use some of these detailed methods but there are thousands and thousands of methods that are available in all of these different classes now which method have we used the most we've used system dot out dot print LN. So we could scroll down this page and figure out which method is the println method, or we can just drop this guy and go to find on this page. And I've already typed in println. So let's go and hit down. And you can see that on this page, um, we have an in and we have an out. Because remember, we can also do system.in and we can also do system.out. You can see some information related to how this thing works. And I don't expect you to understand all of it, but I'm trying to show you where the information is so that as you learn more about Java, you can come back to this and, and understand and learn more about it. It tells you that uh, uh, print stream out is the standard output stream. The stream is already open, ready to accept output data. Typically, this stream corresponds to the display or another output destination specified by the host environment or user. In other words, if you're using a regular computer, then system.out.println is going to output stuff to the screen is what it's trying to tell you. And it gives you a little example here. And then it tells us that there, uh, that there's even more information. It says, see also print stream. Um, dot print ln print stream dot print ln boolean print stream dot print ln care print stream dot print ln and so on if you remember the print ln method we can print integers in there we can print floats we can print characters we can print regular text and quotation marks we can string these things together with the plus sign so it's a very versatile function that can handle lots of different data and put it to the screen and this is showing you the richness of the print ln function telling you that really there are sort of different different um, um, uh, uh, ways in which it handles the data. For instance, if we uh, click on the one that says print ln parentheses int, that means integer, we click that, then it's telling you it's print ln, but it's accepting as an argument an integer, and it says it prints an integer and then terminates the line. This method behaves as though it invokes print with an integer and then print ln, which means you get a new line. You have something similar for long variables, right? which are decimal points, right? So it behaves as though it invokes printing a long variable and printing a blank line. And then we have something for floats, we have something for doubles, and so on. So you see a lot of this stuff is transparent when you're using println. You don't have to worry about this stuff. But behind the scenes, the creators of Java have created the... Um, the interfaces for the print ln function to understand how to print integers to the screen and to understand how to print longs to the screen and to understand how to print floats and doubles and we could go down here and look at all different ways in which uh, later we'll talk about strings how the print ln function handles strings all of that stuff has to be defined by somebody and it's defined by the creators of Java and so all of this stuff is behind the scenes in the java.lang package which is uh, a, and a subset of that would be the system class, and then we have the print stream, and then the print ln method down here. So I'm not expecting you to get anything more out of this other than just understanding the richness of some of these common and sort of easy to use uh, functions and methods, and the detailed information that you can go and get to on the Oracle website here. All right. Now, we said that this was the java.lang uh, package. We didn't have to import anything. We can always use a print ln function because this package is always available. All of these classes are always available. If you click on any one of them, you'll see lots of methods and you know things that you don't quite understand yet because we haven't talked about constructors. But there's methods here that deal with this um, uh, this uh, enum class here. And there, those are things that are always available because they're inside the java.lang um, package. So you can kind of think of them as being the most important uh, or the most commonly used methods and functions uh, inside of Java. But let's go to something that isn't quite so common. Remember we use the scanner class and when we did that we had to type in import uh, java.util right so java.util remember we had to do that so let's click on that and when we go down here 
we had to, we had to type in import java.util uh, .scanner. If we go down and look in the classes that are uh, a part of this package, if we go down to the S's down here, we see a scanner class. So this is giving you a listing of all of the different classes that are part of the java.util package. If we click on scanner, it tells us it's a class called scanner. It tells us that we import it like this, java.util.scanner, right? And then uh, it tells us some information. It says, for example, well, actually, we can uh, read this here. A scanner breaks its input into tokens using delimiter pattern, which by default matches white space. Resulting tokens may be converted to different uh, data types. So that's what, the way that scanner can read in integers and floats and other things. We've kind of done that before. And then it gives a little bit of example code. We define a scanner object, new scanner system.in. We've been doing that in all of our programs. And then we go and take an integer and assign it to the next integer available uh, at the scanner there. So you can get some example code, you can read about different input output cases. There's a lot of information here, a lot more than we have ever had to use in any of our um, uh, any of our programs. But if you look here, uh, here's has next integer. This is what we've used before to figure out uh, if there's another integer waiting for you. Has next float. This is what we figured out. It says returns true if the next token in the scanner's input can, can be interpreted as a float using the next float method. So we've used a lot of this stuff, but I'm trying to show you where a lot of this information comes from. If you need to look up a class, the best bet, in my opinion, is to jump onto the Oracle website, go down here, and then you can click on any of these things and start to see examples of how it's done, what it takes as an input, what it does as an output, and so on. So that is an overview of how to use the website. There are far too many things here to go into detail uh, over, but I wanted to show you the classes. I wanted to show you the basic packages and sort of how to navigate. Now what I want to do is go back to the java.lang package and show you a very important class. Under classes, we will look at the math class, right? Look at the math class because we're going to be doing a lot with that here in the next few lessons. In the math class, if you scroll down, method summary. All right, here are all the methods that are a part of the math class. So ABS returns the absolute value of a double value. This is just like in math class when you take the absolute value of something. Um, we have arc cosine to return the inverse cosine of uh, a number. We can scroll down here and we can see uh, we can do floor, which is kind of like rounding. We can do, uh, what else do we have down here? Square root, here's an important one. Square root, we can pass a double value, which is a decimal value in the form of a double variable to the square root method, and it's gonna return the uh, positive square root value of that number. We have hyperbolic functions. We have tons of functions in here. We're gonna go through these and, and understand a lot of them because they're important to you to learn how to use the basic math functions inside Java, but what I wanna do is that as we go through the next few lessons and learn about the math functions of Java, just remember that you can come here and you can always learn about how to use any of these. For instance, if I wanted to learn how to use a logarithm, right? I could just click on this method called log, which is a member of the math class, and then it'll tell you it returns the natural logarithm base e of the double value, and it gives you some special cases and so on, um, but the bottom line is it gives you a, a basic idea about how to use that particular method. So, this website's very, very important. Here's your packages, here's the classes, and then you can get information about the classes, how to use them, basically how everything's organized. You can go in and poke around here and start learning about all the richness of Java. We're not going to use a lot of this uh, in the short term, except for the math functions we will be using pretty soon. But I wanted you to understand where you can go for more detailed information, because as you learn more about Java, as you learn and look at example code on the web or maybe in a class or something, uh, in your, you know, an exam or something, you may have a need to go and look that class up. And my opinion, the easiest way to do that is right here on this website.